talked about embellishing your wood turnings. There's lots and lots of ways to do that. You know, we start out making a wood bowl and we're fascinated by the grain. And then there's those pieces that yeah, they're missing something. And we start looking for ways to enhance the look, okay? Besides a Dick Singh shape, which is obviously very, very important. If we don't have the good shape, then we need to work on the shape. But if we have the shape, but we don't have the other look to it, we can enhance it. So what I did was I wrote some notes down and I had some pieces that I brought in. Some are from my collection, some I made. So it's a combination. And what I wanted to do was just illustrate some of the things you can do to your bowls or to your pieces to enhance their beauty and the vision that people have when you look at it. Um, so I'll just mention a few and then I'm going to start passing some things around. Obviously painting, you can airbrush, dry brush, there's lots of different coloring techniques. Uh, I'm going to show you what to do with some chroma gilt paste tonight, uh, an idea to enhance the look of the pieces. You can carve, you can burn, you get wood burners, and I had a little neat little piece. It's not really a wood burner, but when you use the tool, you create this look. Can you see that? Where do I want to be? There you go. So there is a set of eyeball makers. You put them in a grinder, or you put them in a, usually a high-speed grinder. I used a die grinder for this, and you can see there's lots of different sizes. So as you're spinning this and pushing into the wood, it heats up the, the, the uh, unit. It makes the dark look on the wood, burns it. You can also get a wood burner and your nichrome metal and stipple things or draw lines or figures. There's another piece. Another piece that I have worked on. You can look at that. And you have to get very, very close to see that the black look there is just little stippled dots burned, wood burned. So this was a burl, and as you turned it, besides making the holes in here, uh, as you hollowed it, um, it left these depressions, and in each depression, as you go around the piece, I did the stippling. A little bit more dramatic. You can start using carvers. And this is a piece that is, Nick Agar had produced it. It's a banksia root. And that's the same tree that makes the banksia pods. And you have to really look at this in detail. Way down in the center, there's three different layers here. And then you just carve and burn on the outside. Beautiful piece. You can use your burner to burn the lines and you get this pattern on here. This was made by one of the turners in uh, the Chicago Club, Don Ham. And besides burning all these lines, which he did in about 15, 20 minutes, you have to color each one of these things and you have to know where the pattern's going. It takes a little bit more concentration, but a nice way to embellish a rather plain piece of wood that was made. This I brought into the, one of the club meetings. This is just a little seed pod. 
It's been hollowed out, turned, of course, and then this was done with a little burner. All these little dots in here were burned, and then there's a little stippling on the very surface of this ridge, and then you get the paint. And it was a dry brush technique for the painting. As you continue to make pieces. I said I would not trip over these cords. I will sure try not to. This is another piece that was I recently made. That's an A with a pattern. It was, the whole thing was painted black and then dry brushed blue and purple color. And then on the very tips of the ridges, we put a little chroma gilt in silver just to enhance the color. So you're getting an idea that there's a lot of different ways to enhance items. I will. And so we can still do carving. And this little piece is a sea urchin box. And it has carving, a little burning, the little black dots are burned. The carving is, if you look really closely, it's done all around each one of these little spots. It goes all the way around the piece. And of course, it's a turned piece. Fun to do. Every once in a while, we're really lucky. Uh, if Does anybody recognize this shape? I can't, I can't hold it any differently. It's a classic shape of John Jordan. And this piece, it turns out that I was the uh, videographer for one of his demonstrations down at uh, Navy Pier at the uh, sofa show. <clears throat> and when he was done with the demonstration, he had this piece, the outside form was done, it was started the hollowing, but it wasn't done. And he took it off the lathe and tossed it to me and he said, here, make something out of this. So about six months later, I took a class from Paul Fennell and learned how to do the patterning and the carving and finish the hollowing. So I thank both of those gentlemen for this piece that I made. It's my, my, actually my favorite piece. Little honeycomb thing. So, this piece is very intricate. You have to get really close to see the olive. Okay? You want to get really close. You can see that it is very intricately designed and it is actually stippled and then painted in between those spaces. And it turns out that it's actually uh, a threaded sphere out of holly. And it was done by Dale Larson and Ben Foe. Uh, and you know, there are some people that learn by listening. Some people learn by looking at things. And some people learn by getting their hands involved when they see something. Uh, I'm one of those people, so whenever it's an opportunity for me to get a hands-on class, I know I'm going to go home and I feel I will have learned something. I don't know how you feel about your learning. If you can go on YouTube and watch things and learn from it, God be with you. Uh, that's not something I'm good at. I am much better when I take a hands-on class. And that's why many years ago for the Chicago Club, I became the demo chairman because I was able to bring in world-class turners for hands-on classes. And uh, I get a, to learn from each one of them a certain skill. And hopefully it continues. Um, we can also do inlays. And I have a couple of pieces of inlays. You can hand me that ring. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
we have, we have to come down on top on that. So we'll do this first, that's fine. This is actually a piece of wood from Ben Fo's inventory. Uh, it's a hollow form made out of zircote. And I decided to enhance the look of it, even though it's a beautiful piece of wood, with some nickel silver and some uh, crushed opal. Um, again, just the idea was to enhance the look of the piece. And here we have a piece of dyed big leaf maple burl, and in the middle of it is a little ring of crushed opal, and that's a ring. Okay, wood rings. Uh, I don't recommend this for everyday use because it doesn't hold up. I will tell you that from experience. My wife will tell you from experience. <clears throat> So I made one for her with uh, the inlay with the, uh, the channel, which is protecting the wood. She's very happy with that. But again, embellish the wood. Okay, so that brings us to these two pieces that I have left here. This is a piece that was from a local artist. And I'm going to pass it around so that you can feel what the surface feels like. It is phenomenal. If you didn't look inside and see the rings, you wouldn't know that it was wood. Uh, besides the fact that it's a beautiful shape, um, our local artist, Don Herndon Charles, was the maker. Question. I'm sorry. You have to speak. Which piece? Show the zircone. Oh, the zircone kind of piece. That was done with a rotary tool. And I love working with rotary tools. It was not a Fordham, but it's like a Fordham. And it's a next step down. Uh, I can't think of the name of the unit. Master the Carver. I'm sorry? The wheat chair or the well, micro motor? The micro motor. It's a micro motor, it's called. And you can get a number of different levels of micromotor if you go on a tree mass tree tree line, tree line. thank you treeline.com uh, they've got some high, high powered ones that uh, besides going up to about 50,000 rpms they have a lot more torque to them uh, i don't need to go there i go with my i've got a reacher which is like the fordham which is I can put in quarter inch burrs. Burrs are all different shapes and sizes, all different coarseness, and you use the one that seems to be good for the job. So for that particular one to make the grooves, I used one that looked more like a, uh, um, a rectangle, let's call it, or so it's just a plain silver with a flat bottom. And I just went down to make that groove all the way around to fit that in there. Okay, so this little piece, and I will turn it this way so you can see it. You can see it's got gold coloring to it, okay? And when you feel it, you can feel the texture of the grain, the summer grain, winter grain kind of thing. It's a little hollow form. It's got no bottom. It's a round bottom. And this was one of a number of pieces that I made not all with the same finish on it, but from a family that had a tree that went down in their grandpa's uh, lot up in Wisconsin, and they needed to have a number of different pieces made from that. Uh, they gave me three great big logs and say, Here, cut them up and do what you can. I ended up making 26 different pieces. This was one of them. Actually, I made 27, didn't I? Yeah. This was one I kept for myself. So, my plan tonight is to show you how I'm making the one with the real smooth surface. And that smooth surface is created using milk paint. And most of the time when we look at milk paint, we just look at that as a color that looks kind of washed out, that sits on the surface of the barn or, or fence or whatever. Uh, oh, that's a good idea. 
And so what we want to do is we want to learn how we can enhance uh, a turning with the milk paint. And what's the technique for doing that? Well, unfortunately, I couldn't find milk paint. I found uh, chalk. chalk paint. Chalk paint and milk paint, they give you the same result. The only problem with chalk paint is when you put a layer on, it takes about two hours for it to dry unless you have a, uh, a hair dryer or a, a portable heat. I forgot to bring that tonight, so I'm not going to put a layer on. I'll just see if I can stand the one we have here and see if you can get the look that I want. This has about four layers of the chalk paint on it, and I did use my uh, heater to heat this up in between layers. And what you're going to do when I pass this around, you're just going to feel this. And that's, when you look at this, you don't know that it's wood. And that's really what I'm trying to accomplish at this point, is make a piece. When people look at it and they pick it up, they go, is that wood? That's what I want to create. And the way it's done is you do different colors, different layers, you dry it, but from layer to layer to layer, the first layer, you sand it to 400. The second layer, after you let it dry, you sand it to 400 and 600. You put a third layer, four, six, eight, maybe 1,000. Last layer, and when we did our project, I think that's what Don did, we went to 2,000, didn't we? I think that's what he had was, you know, a little paper that's 2,000. Well, I have a couple of things from, um, and I'll show you. You can pass that around. Let's do it this way. Good. Merlon Total. And it says a flexible sanding pad. And this is approximately 1,500 grit. Okay? I have one that is 2,500 grit. Um, so we're just going to take a piece. We're going to take this piece, which has three layers already put on it. Um, and we'll start sanding it, see what it looks like. See if I can create just a little bit of, and you can. That's the artistry of it. I can't predict what this is, how this is going to turn out. Yes? Did you say that prior to putting the milk paint on? Uh, I did one. This one I didn't. The one I sanded was really, really smooth. It was more difficult to get the paint to adhere to it. That was my in impression. Um, I made this a little rough. I didn't sand it down. I might have, I might have done, uh, might have gone to 180, but nothing more than that. But then I sanded the two layers underneath to 400 and 600. So this one I'm going to start out at uh, maybe 400, and we'll just go up from there and see what see what we can create. Safety, obviously, if I didn't look at that, it was going to turn it on. It was on high speed, but just make sure it's not going too fast. As you do this, if you're not getting through that top layer and you want to expose some of that other color underneath, then I go down and grit. Yeah, 
I do. We're going to see if we can find out. You can see a little bit right on top. I think there is a blue and there's a copper. And there's a little bit popping through here, but not a lot. this, and I don't know whether you can see this up close, there are some spots, and that's really what I'm trying to create, is spots at different areas as I look at this. And then when you put more colors on, you can get a variety of spots. You can also put the milk paint on in spots and not over the entire surface. That makes me feel safe. It's not going to fly off. So you can see more spots. Now, what that is, is probably the copper color that was under, that I put on originally. Um, and it is, again, let me show you. That was home decor chalk metallic copper, okay? We'll do a little bit more, and then we'll just go up and sand it. I'm going to go to 800. if you're doing this and you don't like what you get, you just coat it with another color. So we've got spots in here, some darker, some lighter, relative to the color. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do, I think I've got a thousand here. We'll do a thousand.
And when you're done with this, as you know, milk paint tends to last a very long time. Um, you really shouldn't have to put any finish on that at all. Beyond that. So let's just assume that that's done. That won't come out, so I'll just have to pass the chuck around, okay? Okay. So that's using no paint. Are there any questions? In my experience in doing that, the milk paint, when you put the layers on it, dry quickly. You sand it down, and you're able to keep that process going as you work for over like an hour or so. You can do three or four coats very quickly. But this, it seemed to take all afternoon, so I would recommend the milk paint as opposed to this. I couldn't find milk paint. Yes, Frank. How would you finish the top? Would it coat the top? Yeah, you can, absolutely. That, that, you could put a, uh, you could put anything over there. Yeah, you could put a lacquer on it. You wanted to make it shiny piece. And if you look at it, it doesn't look like it's finished for me. I would put that, that other coat that I was going to put on, but it wasn't going to dry if I did it here, so I didn't do it. All right. So the next process was to make a turning of an open grain, wide grain wood like ash and burn it, incinerate it essentially, so that you can see a difference between the grain, the uh, summer and winter grains. Uh, I'm gonna pass these two pieces around. These were to be ornaments, hollow. That one was a little thin on the bottom, so it didn't, didn't go very far. But you can get an idea of what that will feel like. And then what you do is with your wipe on paint, and I use the chroma, chroma gilt. Is anybody here familiar with chroma gilt? Chromacraft is a company that uh, actually is right across the street from Nick Edgar studio down in Georgia. And they make this paint, it's pearlescent, and they've got half a dozen colors that they make. And for a lot of the pieces, you don't take it and put it on a brush. You can, but what I do is I put it on my finger and I just highlight pieces. So that's how that little, that little uh, hollow form at the bottom on it uh, was decorated.
said that we shouldn't burn a little bit of torching is good in here, but not a lot. Right No, that's a good idea, too. Have you yeah. turned the torch on already out here? Uh, yeah. Beautiful night, huh? Yeah. Yes, not just propane. <laughs> I'm sorry? You try and stay perpendicular. Well, with this, I want to make sure the whole surface burns. So whatever it takes. And if it stays on fire for a while, it's probably okay. Because this is ash, the softer summer wood is going to be brushed out. And the harder wood is going to be stay in there, and that's the wood. So you're going to pick the correct wood, too. So this is ash. And that should be... That should be burned enough. Ash and elm are two good woods to do this with. Tell you what, let's just maybe give it a little more. that cool down a bit and have the fire go out. Spit on it. Okay. So you want water? Oh no, that's fine. It'll be alright. It'll stop. But you can see it did cook it enough. And that's what I like to do is cook it a lot so that when I now brush that with a steel brush, I'm gonna get all that carbon off. And we're not going to have any, it's going to be softer ridges. They're not going to be hard ridges, but there'll be a lot of ridges, which you can see. And then the idea is we're going to see what that looks like when I apply the, I think, I don't know whether gilt, you tell me what color, gold or silver, or I've got a bunch of different colors we can try on there. So you do use your wire brush by hand, or do you well, turn? Well, you can, I've got, I, I, I did, didn't know how big a group, this is really hard. I thought this was going to be a lot easier. Do you, do you know what this is? Does that look like it? Baseball bats. It's ash. It is ash. That's what I thought. Um, it is hard. Really hard. Do you ever have was, one in I your hands? Gonna... <laughs> Mine or I got autographed <laughs> once, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People ask me about Willie Mays, too. You get one hit off me, pitch against him ten times. One hit, five strikeouts, two walks. Ten times, I guess. Yeah, no home runs. 
<laughs> anyway, so you can look actually look at that, and you can see the see that how that is still not burned in there. Mm -hmm. I need to burn. I need that to all be burned, so that when you're using your wire brush, I want it to be end up looking black. Also, that's my goal. You can paint it. You can put a dye on there to make it look black if you want to, to get the end product. Um, I like to burn it. Do you ever done anything like this on the inside? Uh, I haven't yet. No, just been doing the outside. And yeah, I think if I'm going to put color on it, I really want that black. If I'm doing this demo thing, I might as well get it as black as I can. I can't see the close enough of a surface, but is it cracking at all because it's getting burned? It's um, something that you would avoid if you used a dye. That's this all. is dead dry. That's all I'm going to say. This wood is, it's probably been drying for 10 or 15 years. And you're just burning it enough so it um, you can see the bright red on the surface, right? I just want to, yeah, I want to get down and I just want every all the parts to be burned. Right. We'll try it again. Picture froze in there, so I don't know if you can get it from. I think we're just outside the range. The walls are out of I use them a lot. Yeah. No, it's pretty nice. And it's great for that looks good. especially like something like that. Yeah. So we'll let that relax. Now, I made there's another cutter that uh, that I use which is like a chainsaw. That might be actually better. A little bit wider. And uh, it's a King Arthur tools. And uh, Oh, I'll show that. I've got it in there. I haven't put it on. I'm sorry? A quarter inch hood. Yeah, I think so. Well, it's about yeah. that big around. It's a two inch, two inch diameter. Yeah, right. Years ago, we had a guy show up and demonstrate that. He had a, an eight inch gash up his arm scar. Well, that's why I was being it. very cautious and I had the cutter going away from me. Yeah, I don't know. But I was waiting for it to catch. Being cautious. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> There are a yeah. lot of lawsuits against that. Oh, really? Device. Yes. Chainsaw one, right? Well, then. It is outlawed, I believe, in England. You know, something I thought of that would be a lot easier that I do is I use a mallet and a large gouge. I make 80% uh, oh. of that cut. Then sure. Just couldn't, just because you've already got the groove cut out. I got you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, that's not a bad idea. A little. Uh, a little preemptive and that's your design also yeah sure. you're not fighting with it yeah. you're more or less just going right along yeah well since you live and learn see mm -hmm. <laughs> i learned i learned one, one way, way and now i'm just I'm Time to turn on your dust collector. Absolutely. So I'm just trying to get off the carbon.
think this is good enough. I think that's going to be a little bit of a photo. Let's try it. No, no. I'm just going to hold it like this to do it. So, so this gives you just a little idea of some of the color options you have. I think there's one more. Almost. This is what I got from them uh, initially. A variety of gold, silver, blues, a purple amethyst, they call it, verdigris, which is green, and then there's a gold green, and I think there's another one that's a mix. Well, this is a blue violet. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just to illustrate, I'm not gonna do the whole thing because I wanna get this finished and then decide what color I want for the gold. I'm not going to do mixtures or one whole color. But let me just let me just pick one and uh, highlight and just show you what that looks like. I like to apply this with my fingers. Let me see if we can just do this. And I just kind of run it together so that I've got it on both sides, and then I'm going to get. This is so that it hits the high spots. It does not hit all of it. So it gives you a sense of elevation, lift. So there's the purple. And I would make it much blacker on the inside. In other words, I'm not going to leave it like this. It doesn't, it may look black to you, but it's not black. It's just brown. And I want that to be really black. That's going to make that color stand out better. Let me see if I can. No. Paper towel. Didn't bring one. Oh, look at Marie. She's got a paper towel. I'm going to try a different color in here just to see what it looks like. Oh. Look at this, I got one green. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. All right. Thank you. So this is Viking silver. Let's just say we did that, and then
highlighting, using your colors. I like this material because you really don't need to put anything over that. You don't need a, a finisher over that, although Chromacraft does sell a lack, not a lacquer, I think it's a, um, it is a, it is a spray finish, that's what I think. Um, I've never been really happy with spray finishes um, because I get very impatient and I get little bubbles. And that's not what I was learning from that fellow over there who talked to Teacher Singh. He said, just paint it on, brush it on, sand it back. Anyway, that was what I wanted to show you tonight. Burning, carving. Are there any questions? Good. Call it time.